Amen. Good to be here tonight. Every my, amen. Everybody say amen. Glad to be in God's house. Good to have a day to study his word and glean from it and meditate on it and think on it. And every time I read and I did a little prep work today on the next Watchman broadcast. And um, every time I read something that a supposedly Christian organization says about the Bible, it angers me. I get stirred up. And today it was out of the Catholic Catechism and what they said about the Bible. And if any Catholic says, we believe the Bible, just say, you're a liar too. Well, you don't have to be that mean about it, but they don't. And they're told not to believe in everything the Bible says. Uh, it's everything the Pope says. It's called the magisterium. And the magisterium determines what you should believe about the Bible and what you shouldn't believe about the Bible. And there's even um, a thing that they wrote against fundamentalists that would be us and how wrong we are and all I did after I read that was just look at the word scripture in the Bible and found out it wasn't wrong amen just makes it so uh, by the way somebody uh, if Donna's listening to this uh, I had somebody else write in haven't heard anybody say anything for a while about the pure Bible search software but uh, somebody uh, wrote in and said that they've been enjoying the broadcast and um, that they went out and bought a King James Bible and it's changed their life. And they said that Bible search software, wow, it's like changed my whole life. And I said, well, yeah, because now you get to actually search the scriptures. The easiest way possible you can search the scriptures and you find all kinds of things that God said in there. Amen. It just blows me away. All right. Um, all right. John chapter one. Good to have you with us tonight. Good to have everybody online with us tonight. We appreciate you and love you and uh, thank God for you. Remember to pray for all of our ministries. Pray for. Uh, the people of Kenya, especially Turkana, um, it's really bad there. It really, really is bad there. And um, if I had, if I had just a small portion of the budget of the United States of America, nobody in Kenya would go to bed hungry. It it breaks your heart. When you see the, the level of corruption over there, because just like in North Korea, North Korea would threaten to bomb South Korea out of existence. And all that was was just a play for money. And the United Nations would step in and North Korea would say, well, I'll tell you what, we'll turn our missiles off if you send us a billion dollars in aid money. Because our people are, uh, there's no work and they're all starving. So the United Nations send over a billion dollars. Well, the Kim family ended up with most of that. And the higher up politicians ended up with the rest of it. And you still got people starving to death in North Korea because they don't care. They don't do anything for them. And uh, that's kind of the way it is here. Kind of the way it is in Kenya, especially. You got a lot of politicians over there that are hoarding money that doesn't belong to them and they neglect their people. And so we're still trying to find grain for them, still trying to find food for them. And as long as the Lord provides, we're going to do our best. Amen. John chapter one. We'll start again in verse six and um, read down to verse 14. Glad you're with us tonight. Uh, for, uh, John chapter one, verse six, there was a man sent from God whose name was John, different John. This would be John the Baptist. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, 
but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Just a quick note, since I'm dealing with false prophets uh, in the Watchman broadcast, th this stuff is on my mind. One of the ways, and there's a multitude of ways to spot a false prophet. One of them is they will try to make themselves as close to Jesus as they possibly can get away with it. In other words, they will elevate themselves or even possibly reduce Jesus down in order to make themselves look almost as good as God is so that people follow them. Here's John the Baptist, however, who does the exact opposite. He says of himself, I'm not that light. I'm not the Messiah. I am not the Christ. There's coming somebody and John had a certain amount of popularity at one time. Everybody came out to hear him preach. They liked what he had to say. He wasn't like the Pharisees. But with all of those people who were sort of coming to hear him preach, John was very quick to let them know there's somebody coming after me whose shoe latchets I'm not even worthy to loose. I, I would, there's no way I'm even close to him. That's a true man of God who distances himself from Jesus Christ, abases himself so that Christ is exalted. And what you have with a lot of false prophets is they want to be right up there next to Jesus so that everybody looks at Jesus and sees them standing right next to him. The Pope calls himself the vicar of Christ. In other words, I am Christ here on this earth and there's nobody higher than me. They call him Holy Father. That's blasphemy. He puts himself up there as close to God as he possibly can. And that way everybody does what he says. And that's just one of the ways that you could spot a false prophet. Uh, verse 9, that was the true light. Talking about Christ. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. He came into his own and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. And we talked about that last Wednesday night. I'm going to just cut, going to touch on a couple things on this because that's going to segue into what we're going to see in verse 14. To them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born, not of blood. In other words, the race that you and I are from now is not the Caucasian race, the Negroid race, the Mongoloid race, or any mixture of those races. We are of a different blood. A different seed, a different nation. See, I believe in nations. I believe that every group of people ought to have the right to rule and govern over themselves because God did make us all the same in that we're human. But everybody around the world's different. Russian people are different. They eat different things. African people are different. They eat different things. Europeans are different. Americans are different and so on. So I believe in nations. And I believe in the dividing of those nations. But God has called us out from among everybody else in the world and made us what he says was a peculiar people. Amen. As many as received him to them gave you power to become the sons of God. And there's only one group of people. That qualify for that. Even to them, and here it is, them that believe on his name, which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh, here it is, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Father, we ask your blessings now in your word tonight. Thank you, Lord, for Time spent in your word. Lord, it refreshes our week. We're glad to be here tonight. We're glad to be watching along online. I pray, dear God, that you allow us to continue that as long as possible. Father, we can see days approaching where the censorship's really going to kick in. 
And Father, we'll just have to trust you for those days. You know it's coming. You already have a plan for it. Father, we just pray, God, that we follow you and we trust you. I pray, dear God, that through the things that I say from the first day, God, that you called me into this until the last day that you have for me on this earth, that everyone who hears my voice would be convinced that they can trust this holy book. They can trust every word it says. They can believe in every word it says. They can know these words, be guided by these words, think on these words. And Father, they really don't need me or anybody else. They need the Holy Ghost leading them as they study this book. I pray, dear God, you would just turn people's hearts back to the book. Bless your word tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, and that's another thing that Catholic catechism said, was that they were not a religion of the book. Now, I'm paraphrasing what they said, but that threw me. I'm going, boy, talking about blatant heresy. That's what it is. And I'll, you'll be able to see that when the, well, I haven't recorded it yet. But you'll be able to see it when it comes out. Uh, but anyway, think about this. The, the passage we just read, John chapter 1, verses 6 through 14. Verse 14 ends up Jesus leaving heaven. We know that he was up in heaven. He left heaven, came down to earth to be born of a virgin, to be born of a woman, to be born a human. He came down as the son of God. To become the son of man so that we sons of man could become sons of God. Somebody say amen to that. Uh, Romans, Romans 8. Turn there. Romans 8. I know I touched on this last Wednesday night, but I'm, I'm just going to hit something here. So that we can get an understanding of why God did what he did. And I might throw in how other religions sort of have a mockery of this. Romans chapter 8, verse 18. Actually, go back to 17. If children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. And what that means is that as far as the inheritance is concerned, we are equals with Christ. What he receives, we will receive. He's not going to be mean about it. and not going to say, well, that part's mine. You can't touch mine. He's going to share everything with us. Joint heirs with Jesus. When you file a tax return, several ways of filing, isn't there? You can file as a married couple separately or how? Jointly. Which means you're both paying the bill. Or you're both getting the refund. That's what that means. And it doesn't stipulate, well, the wife earned less money, so she gets less of the refund. There's no law that says that. They mail one check out, got both people's names on it. You both get it equally. And that's what that means. Join heirs with Christ. If, if, so be we suffer with him that we may be also glorified together. Now, if, let's just stop for a minute and ask the question, what if we're the generation that gets to see Jesus in the air? What if we are that generation? Cool. After it happens, cool. Um, but there's going to be suffering. I believe that. There's going to be suffering. Now, I'm not looking forward to that. Other generations before us, they may not have had it that bad. But I think the generation that sees Jesus in the air is going to suffer. Well, Jesus came down here as God and as man. To show us, to, to walk before us 
and to be a, uh, a role model for us that if he can do it, he will help us do it. That's what I believe. That's why I believe he came down here. He suffered as we do, yet without sin. He was tempted as we are, yet without sin. He endured um, sorrow. He endured the death of loved ones. He endured the pangs of hunger. He endured the, the pain of being scourged. He endured the pain of the cross. And he suffered and destroyed the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And once his death was over with, then he suffers no more. And so that's why, or it's one of the reasons why I love the Jesus that I love and I believe in. Because he did that. He didn't just sit up and on high and say, Oh, I feel sorry for you pitiful humans. I don't know what it's like, but it looks like you're going through a mess. He came down here to suffer through it for us to show us, yes, I know what it's like and I have compassion on you. Because then he says, verse 19 or verse 18, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Somebody that a family that follows our ministry, they're going through a very, very tough time right now. Very, very bad ordeal with their family. And there is a very, very evil, very wicked person in their family that is just launching attack after attack after attack on this family and won't let up. And this evil family member is living the good life. And the family that this person is persecuting is really struggling and suffering. And it bothered them. And I said, don't worry. They're going to get their reward now. We're going to get our reward later. And I said, better than they can get now. That's true. Amen. That's how it's going to happen. Your first moment in heaven will cause you to forget all of the suffering in this life. All of it. That's what he said. I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed unto us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. Hasn't been manifested yet. People look at us and they see it. We look like everybody else. They can't see the manifestation of the sons of God yet, but they're going to. For the creature was made subject to vanity. Vanity means that's why you get sick. That's why you lose your car keys. That's why your car won't start one day. That's why bad things happen. That's why, uh, that's why bad people seems like get everything and you get nothing. That's the vanity of this world. If you want to choose the vanity of this world, there's plenty of vanity in this world to go around for everybody. But like Moses, he refused to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season denying those things, choosing rather to receive glory afterward. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of the corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. We are going to be in absolute perfect bliss one of these days that will never die down. Never, ever die down. Um, now, 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Glorified. Perfect body. 
No more pain, no more suffering, no more sorrow, no more anxiety, no more back aches, front aches, no more being ugly. Amen. Have, you'll have it all. Your best life then. I ought to write a book. Your best life later. Amen. Now, back to John chapter 1, verse 14. And the word was made flesh. Think about that. In fact, look up on the screen. That's what that looks like. The word, DNA, is a book. That's all it is, is a book. And that book has in it the recipe, the instructions, how to put the proteins together, how to fold the proteins, how to make the organs of the body, how to make the organs work, how to make the enzymes, how to make snot. That's in your DNA. Okay? How to make spit. Right? I mean, we don't drink spit to get it, do we? No, we make it. That's all in our DNA. And the Word, which was what God said, was made flesh. And remember, He's already established now, in John 1, that the Word was God. He's already established that. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. The Word, God, was made flesh like us. And how much of Him was God? All of Him. How much of Him was flesh? All of Him. I don't understand it, but that's what I believe. And dwelt among us. You think Jesus ever had sleepless nights? I believe He did. Think Jesus ever woke up with a backache? We know he was hungry. We know that he felt pain. We know that he felt... In fact, the Bible says he was a man of sorrows acquainted with griefs. We know that he grieved over people, people that wouldn't listen to him, people that died. Grieving over uh, people who came to follow him but then turned away, he grieved over them. He grieved over his own people, Israel. He grieved over Jerusalem, saying, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. He grieved. He knows the sorrows and the heartaches of living among us, just like we know him. He wasn't... In fact, when they offered Jesus what they offered him on the cross, there's some that say that that was sort of like an anesthetic. It was wormwood which was, if you, they make a liqueur out of wormwood, which is absinthe, and it's like an intoxicant. It kind of makes you, woo okay? And he tasted it. It was very bitter, but he refused it. In other words, it looks like they were giving him something that would dull his pain, but he didn't take it. I'm telling you, that's not me. You offer me something for pain, I'll take it. Okay? Christ denied himself of all of that to experience the pain, to know what it's like so that he can come to us when we are in pain. So, not that so he can come to us and say, um, you shouldn't be in pain, so I'm going to take all your pain away. So that while we are in pain, he can comfort us and say, I know. I know what it feels like. I've been there. And isn't that what Paul told us? That we comfort one another with the same comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted. And that's Jesus. He is able now to succor us, to comfort us, to care for us. For what we've gone through because he's been through it. So the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten 
of the Father, full of grace and truth. Turn to 1 Timothy 3.16. And let me ask this question. Is it important that we must believe that God became mortal man, became flesh? Do we have to believe that? According to John, we do. John said, if anybody that denies that, that's the spirit of Antichrist. If any man denies that Jesus came in the flesh, it's the spirit of Antichrist. By the way, I used to, along about this time, I would be showing you what the NIV says in those places. They've since changed it. Because the NIV used to take out in the flesh... And unless I was looking in the wrong place the other day, it looks like they've changed it back now to where it should be. And I've noticed that they've done that on several things over the years. Okay? Get, they were taking stuff out, getting caught, slipping them back in, in some cases, not all. I'm not saying the NIV is a good Bible. But why would you have a Bible that they're constantly changing because... People didn't like what you took out. If you really don't believe that belongs in the word of God, then stick with your guns. Amen. Anyway, First uh, Timothy 3.16. This is something that they have altered and kept it altered. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Who was manifest in the flesh? God was. But according to the NIV and the New American Standard and the Christian Standard Bible which is the Southern Baptist Bible, and all of the other modern translations, they have omitted God and replaced it with He. He appeared in a body. They took out one of the most important doctrines in the Bible, the fact that the Word, God, became flesh and dwelt among us. They took that out. And it looks like that it's a return to Gnosticism. Gnosticism said that God was way too holy and way too separated and way too superior to have any contact whatsoever with material man or the material world. So he created a lesser God who created a lesser God who created a lesser God and a lesser God and a lesser God and a lesser God. And I don't know how many, how far it goes down till finally one could create this universe. The Gnostics believed that Jesus only appeared to be real, but he wasn't real. He would walk in the sand and leave no footprints. He would walk through the water and leave no wake. He wouldn't, he just was, was like a, uh, phantasm. Is that, am I saying that right? Like a ghost. Okay. A phantom is what I'm trying to think of. Not real, which denies what the scripture says. And so does all of the modern Bibles by saying he appeared in a body. Well, that's what Satan did when he entered into Judas Iscariot. He appeared in a body. But it's different than saying God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. It was God and the word was God and the word was made flesh. No way around it. Hebrews chapter 2. So I'm trying to think about this plan that God had. It wasn't an afterthought. It wasn't something that. After Adam and Eve sinned, God took out a scratch pad and started drawing out ideas of what he could do now to fix the mess that Adam and Eve got, had gotten the world into. It was already foreordained. It was already known. It was already planned what would happen. So let's take now the devil. Whose plan, according to scripture, is I will be like the Most High. I will... I, as God, will sit in the temple of God and make everybody think that I am God. But he's not God. He's the opposite of God. God gives life. The devil's a murderer. 
Okay, God is love, the devil hates, so on and so on. So, we're warned about another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel. We're all warned all throughout the scriptures about the devil and his angels pretending to be God, but doing the exact opposite of what God did. So think about God's plan. God uh, conceiving in the womb of a virgin, his only begotten son, the son of God being born as a mortal on this earth, and then being the savior of mankind. So think of opposites. Not the son of God, the what? Son of the gods. Or what you have in Genesis 6. The sons of God, the little g gods, taking wives and creating hybrid species. Half God, half human. Okay? That to me makes sense of what did happen and I believe that that's going to happen again. It, it's a mockery and these giants were always the rulers, of course, naturally. I mean, if you're Goliath, you don't take orders from a guy that's five foot eight. Yeah, I'm the king. You do what I say. No, I'm the giant. You do what I say. So, and Og was, Sion was a giant. I believe the five kings that hid in the cave in Joshua 10, I think they were giants. We know that these giants were the kings in Canaan land. And the saviors, the protectors, the lords over those people. The five lords of the Philistines, I think, were probably giants as well. But the, the opposite idea, and I think that is also going to happen again one of these days. Hebrews 2.17 Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. To be made like us. That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. To make reconciliation for the sins of the people. If you are an alcoholic and you've been in recovery for 10, 15 years. And a guy comes to you and says, hey, I hear that you used to drink a lot and you don't anymore. I need help. Do you help them? Absolutely. In fact, who's better qualified? Not too many people. Certainly somebody that's never touched anything like that, never did anything wrong. The people who have been drunkards, who've wrecked their cars, or did things that they never want to talk about ever again, they can help. And they have compassion on the people that want the help. More so than maybe other people do. Other people would say, he's a drunk, worthless, no good. Never amount to anything. But then you've got somebody who's been there, who then turned their life around, made something of themselves. They can go to that person and say, you know what? I, I've been where you are. Let me help you out. Amen. That's what that says, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. To make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Remember what we read uh, Sunday morning, last Sunday, not the other day, but a week ago the other day. That Jesus was not ashamed to call us brethren. He's not ashamed of us, even though he knows what we did, what we've done. He's not ashamed of us. 
I wasn't ashamed. We was talking about uh, my brother-in-law, Steve, today. I wasn't ashamed to preach his funeral. In fact, that's God answering my prayer. I've said, God, I want to know that Steve goes to heaven when he dies. Because I'll preach his funeral. I've got to be able to tell everybody. I know he's in heaven or I'm not sure where he is. God, would you fix that? And God fixed it. And I don't have a problem in the world telling everybody I know where. And a, a man came up to me after that message. Steve's funeral. And said, you know, he said, I was down in Bonterre the other day and talking to some cops down there. And he said, they knew Steve. They'd heard that Steve died. One of the cops said, I wonder where he is right now. And they all kind of looked at each other. And he said, I'm going to go back down there and find them guys and tell them that I know where he is now. Amen. I wasn't ashamed to call him my brother. Amen. Not ashamed to call my family my family. Jesus is not ashamed to call us brethren. That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Romans 8, 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. The son of God came to be the son of man so that the sons of man can be sons of God. Know what it's like. Galatians chapter 4. And all of these are secondary witnesses to the true meaning of John chapter 1 verse 14. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. So that there's no mistaking, no misunderstanding. As I said, the internet is full of false doctrine. And it wouldn't surprise me a bit if the devil had you pass by some YouTube channel that had you believe in that Jesus was no longer God. Why wouldn't that surprise me? Because it's happened before. It's happened. I've preached my guts out to people, explaining them and, and proving to them from the scriptures these things that we believe and these things that we hold dear. And they would say, Amen, 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 only to go out, let somebody twist scripture to them, and now they don't believe it anymore. Now they're teaching something else. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a what? A woman. By the way, that's an earth human woman. Not a Martian woman. Not one from the planet Zarkon or Venus. Made of a human woman. Made under the law. Did they not circumcise Him on the eighth day? Did Mary not bring in uh, Joseph and Mary bring into the temple when they brought Jesus to be circumcised their gifts according to the law. Did they not do that? Of course they did. To redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. He's the birth son. We're the adopted sons. I don't care as long as I get to be in there somewhere. Amen. Matthew chapter 1 verse 23. What does the name Emmanuel mean? And that was actually prophesied back in Isaiah twice. Behold, a virgin shall be with child. Does it have to be a virgin? Yes. Why? So that scripture is fulfilled. And shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. And I've always wondered, and I don't know that I 100% know the answer to this, but they said they would call him Emmanuel. And yet, as soon as that happened, nobody ever called him Emmanuel. In fact, Matthew 1, 23, you're looking at the last place in the Bible the word Emmanuel is found. It's not in Mark, 
Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians. It's not anywhere in there. Does that mean the Bible's wrong? No. I think that's his second coming name. Because he's going to come down here and stay with us. God, and, and just think about the term Emmanuel. It means God is with us. So, was he always God? Yes. When he became a human, was he still God? Yes. God with us. And always will be God. Amen. First John chapter 4, turn there. Here's where we get, here's where some people are going to get in some big trouble. Now, I don't know what form this is going to take. Because he said this is, this, this is how you are going to identify the spirit of Antichrist. And I'll be honest with you, even the Catholic Church says that Jesus was God in the flesh. So I don't know, you know, I, I just don't know what form the spirit of Antichrist is going to take as far as this prophecy is concerned. He says, 1 John 4, verse 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. I've actually heard people tell that they would, especially missionaries, third world countries, who being presented with someone that they thought might be possessed of devils, they would try the devil. They would see if it really was a devil or if somebody just had something wrong in their brain. And they would ask the person, did God come in the flesh? And if it was the spirit, the spirit wouldn't be able to confess it or something like that. But beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone into the world. Jesus said that. Peter said that. The Bible says it everywhere. We're going to be surrounded by false prophets here very quickly. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Now again, when it says, And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. I don't know how that's going to show up. It may be just as obvious as that. A spirit, a deceiving spirit... And of course, the world then would follow that spirit, but that spirit somehow would proclaim Jesus Christ did not come in the flesh. Somehow, some way, it's going to say that. And those of us who believe the Bible, we're going to go, I know what you are. Every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist. Whereof ye have heard that it should come, and now, and even now already, it is it in the world. And again, I, I'm going to have to look back at the NIV, the current NIV, because they keep changing it, because they keep changing the Greek text. And, um, but they used to omit every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come, and they would leave out in the flesh in that verse. They would leave that out. Well, that marks, that tells you that's the spirit of Antichrist right there. But I, I may have been looking in the wrong place or whatever, but it seems like they've slipped that back in. And, and that wouldn't surprise me. And this is that spirit of Antichrist. Second John chapter one, verse seven. For many deceivers are in into the world. He says it again. Many false prophets, many deceivers are in and into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. So now that God has told you this twice, should you believe it? Should you remember it? Okay. Uh, Garrett, have you figured out any of your professors, if they say something like 20 times in a row, 
What does that mean? Going to be on the test. Okay? It's going to be on the test. They're just cluing you in, okay? All right. So, is Jesus Christ God? Did God, was he manifest in the flesh? Is the word God? Did the word become flesh? Yes. Remember this. Because you're going to see it again. That's why he's telling you that. So many times he's telling you, remember this, remember this, remember this. You may not understand it, Mount. You may not see it. You may not be able to picture and draw the picture in your mind of how somebody's going to announce on the news that Jesus Christ did not. Scientists discovered Jesus didn't come in the flesh. I don't know how it's going to present itself. I just know that it is. And we're going to need to know that. That's going to save our soul. Amen. Amen. Amen.